Oh. Dennis, that's quantity of charge. Go for it. Got it. Okay. Okay. All right, share my screen. Okay, we see it. Excellent. And let me make this small so it's out of my way. Oh. Let me go here and get this oh. out of my way. Where is it? All right. So this week we are doing module six or chapter six, which is communicating with other hands. And I will tell you that this, this is one of those chapters that, um, how can I phrase it? It's not as sexy as propagation. It's not as, you know, cool and interesting as, you know, antennas and how they work. And and if you're into math, you know, there's we're not doing any of that here. <clears throat> but a lot of this information is uh very necessary. Um so I'm I'm hoping to do my best to not bore you. And I will tell you that as we go through this, you know, we're going to be going through, you know, all the questions. As we've said uh, many times before, our object here is to get you to pass the test. You will really deeply learn amateur radio when you're doing it, because that's when you really learn. Um, we're we're trying to get you to pass the test. So as we're going through, please chime in, stop me if you got questions. And uh between me, uh me, Bob, and uh and uh good old what's his name? I'll never forget him. Ken. <laughs> Ken. Oh my gosh. I got Al stuck in my head and I couldn't get around Al. And I knew his name is not Al. And I couldn't give me So between me and Ken and Bob, um, we will surely have the answer to any questions you may have. So start with band plans. Maybe if I can get this to cooperate. Why aren't you changing? Thank you. So band plans are voluntary agreements and let me point out some things when you see red on my screen like this <clears throat> pay attention to it because there's going to be some question you know in the uh in the questions <clears throat> excuse me about that exact you know subject of you know so there'll be something about voluntary agreement um in our in our questions so lock those, try to lock those ones in as tight as you can. Um, so it's an amateur agreements designed for normal conditions. They're not regulations, though. Uh, amateur radio is the only service that can tune freely and use multiple modes within their allocations. Uh, amateur radio band plans can be found at you know this uh, this URL here. So if you wanna wanna go there and you can, um, you know, print out print out your own band plan band plan and put it on your wall. It's a good thing to have, especially as a technician, because like we've said before, with technician, you know, it's the first step in 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 amateur radio. It's the lowest of the three levels. And 
that limits you on where you can uh, go uh, in in you know in the different bands in the different frequencies. So your band plan is going to be your best friend to stop you from breaking the law. Um, so the two meter band plan is on the following slide. Uh, and this, you know, this is kind of describing a band plan, but I'm going to give you a better idea of, you know, better example of a band plan coming up. Um, and so here are some of the, some of the, um, Um, you know, places you can go, some of the frequencies you can go to um, that are kind of set for certain things. So this is in your book if you want to print that out. Um, I don't really use it, um, but, you know, I don't know. I, they have it in here, so I'm sure, I'm sure some people use it, but, you know, so it may be helpful to you. So HF band plans tend to be simpler than VHF and UHF because there are no repeaters or I don't know if there are no repeaters. Somebody just told me that uh, made a comment in a net about a HF repeater. And I never got back to that. So there may now be, you know, HF repeater somewhere, but I'm not familiar with them and the book says there aren't any so if there's a question on uhf and vhf and repeaters there aren't any you know even if there are today there aren't any as far as the book says and that's what you got to go with on your on your uh, answers to your to your test uh other common uses limited limited listed in band plans are beacons, weak signal, satellite uplinks and downlinks, simplex, repeater input out input and outputs, and control links. And from my perspective, the two that are most frequently used, especially by technicians, would be simplex and the repeater inputs and outputs. So this is a band plan, and this is what you might print out and put up on your wall. Um, this gives you um, all the different bands. You've heard us say two meter, um, pull my hair out here. You've heard us talk about two meter. You've heard us talk about 70 centimeter. I think I showed you a little teeny antenna that I made for 20, 23 centimeter. Um, we've talked about a little bit about 10 meter. Um, and these are all places that you're allowed to go. You can see over here on the side, EAGT. I'm looking at the six meter, EAGT. And if we look down here, E is Amateur extra, A is advanced, G is general, T is technician, and N is novice. And you're probably saying to yourself at this point, wait a minute. You said, and you've you guys have said a bunch of times, there's only three levels: technician, general, and amateur extra. Why are there five here? Well, the law has changed. And the FCC only has three today. There used to be a novice and there used to be an advanced. You cannot acquire those licenses anymore, but there are still people alive today that have advanced and novice licenses. So you'll see this for Probably I'm gonna I'm gonna speculate you'll see this for another 10, 
maybe 20 years maximum. And then it's only going to be on the, on the band plans. You're only going to see the three because anybody who had an advanced or a novice will have either upgraded or passed away, gone silent key. And so, um, but right now, when you see those, that's, that's what that means. Now, we're going to dig a little deeper into this. And on the next slide, what I have shown circled here is what we're going to see. And I also want to pull this back up here. I said no math before, but I remembered I added this to this slide. Remember, when you're trying to figure out a band, what band is that? The speed of light, 300. And this would be, this is really 3 million. Um, but um, because we're doing megahertz you know we've had to move the decimal place over in the three million and it becomes 300 divided by the frequency in megahertz and whoops and that will give you your frequency and we talked about that before but i just wanted to remind you of it because something is on the test for that so in this as I showed you those two circles, we'll dig a little deeper and get a little closer so we can see what this shows here. Um, you know, the red is RTT uh, and data. Green is phone and image. And if you remember before, I told you phone is talking into your microphone. Uh, CW, uh, carrier wave or, or Morse code. Um, yellow is single sideband. And when you see these colors, that means only. Um, well, that isn't necessarily true. Because I think you can um, do, correct me if I'm wrong, Bob. I'm not sure if I'm right or not. Because um, I don't do CW. Can you do CW any place in here? Oh, no, it's only right here. Let me rephrase it. Can I do single sideband anywhere in here on 40 meters? The answer is yes, right? I think so, yeah. Okay. So, but if, let's say this little box up here was yellow, that would mean from 7.075 .07 to 7.1, you can only do single sideband, period. Okay. So that's what that would mean. Um uh, blue would be USB phone, CW, RTTY, and data. And orange is fixed digital message forwarding systems only. And I know there's not all those colors in here, but this is the norm. This is what you're normally going to see. I'm going to go back to here and show you that, you know, we got the blue over here. Um, I don't see any... Oh, here's, and here's orange here. You know, so um, it's all, it's all laid out in here and who can and where. Uh, if I go back to this, um, we see off to the side here, um, the amateur extra can talk anywhere in the 40 meter band. The um, um, I missed this box there. The advanced can speak in almost anywhere in the band. The general can go in here and in here. And I'll tell you a little story. I was a general, um, and about, uh, sometime in the middle of last summer, I was, you know, doing, just doing some, uh, contacts just trying to meet new people and stuff and i found somebody that was calling cq we'll get into that in a few minutes what that means they were calling cq and so i responded to them and we talked for a few minutes and and said hello and you know talked a little bit about our antennas and stuff and blah 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 and then we went on our way someone else was 
you know, waiting to talk to this person also. And so I went to log it. I keep a logbook. Everybody should keep a logbook of your contacts. And I went to log it and I looked down and I was at 7.12 something. I'm a general. I was illegal. I was in a band, I was in a frequency within this band that I'm not supposed to be in. It happens from time to time. Did they take away my license? No. Um, if someone, if someone, you know, of authority found out, they would probably slap me on the hands and say, hey, you're general, you're not supposed to be here. And I'd apologize profusely and get the heck out of there. Um, but that's why I went and got my extra so I wouldn't make that mistake again. But it's all labeled right here so you can see where you can and cannot be. As a technician, the only thing you're allowed to do allowed to do in the 40 meter band is Morse code. So you can't do any talking at all. You can't do any single sideband. You can't do any RTT wired data. You can only do Morse code. So that gives you a good good idea of how the band excuse me the band plan works. And uh, highly suggested that you get a printout of it. You can buy one from ARRL. Um, th there's lots of places on the internet where they have pictures of it that you can just download. Um, I don't know if they made them themselves. I'm hoping they didn't steal them. Um, I'm hoping it's legal what I'm telling you to do. I think it is. Um, but the one you would buy would be a nice laminated hard you know not a piece of paper and so that's why you're that's why they would charge you for it from ARRL me personally I don't I don't need that uh, kind of thing I just printed it out on a on a piece of paper on my printer and I got it so making contacts on repeaters now um have we talked about repeaters yet uh no not really no okay i wonder why they put this in, in this order anyway let me just talk a little bit about repeaters repeaters are uh radios that are in a location usually pretty high up in the air and they're general purpose is so that your weak signal can go a lot further it takes your signal it takes your you know what are you you you're talking to the microphone it takes that and transmits it on a different signal with a lot more power so you can get out a lot further um on the little handheld radio, you got maybe a mile. Um, you can pull out your little handheld radio, and if you connect to a uh, repeater, gosh, you can go 10 miles, maybe even more, because um, the repeater is kicking out that signal for you. Now, we may say this later in, in this chapter, I don't remember, but the repeater has an offset. When you transmit, you will notice on your radio that the frequency changes when you hit the transmit button because it receives on a frequency and transmits on another frequency. So when you tune to the frequency, it's where you're listening. It's where it's transmitting. And then when you transmit, it changes the frequency so that it takes your signal, sends it to the other frequency, and blasts it out there like a megaphone. So that's how the basics of how a repeater works. So before you transmit, um, 
uh, make sure first that you're able to, to you know able to be on that frequency that you're authorized to be on that frequency um there's you know have have manners repeaters are used by everybody as an, as in every frequency is used by everybody no one owns a frequency okay so we want to be respectful so that everybody can use what everybody has access to so the first thing you should do is listen make sure nobody's talking on that frequency already on that trans on that repeater already um you should always keep your transmission somewhat short um you should always identify it you know in a legal way um the easiest uh, easiest way to attract listeners is give your call sign followed by monitoring. Notice that's in red. Um, so I would say November 8, Victor Delta Zulu, monitoring, or just N8VDZ, monitoring. And that lets anybody who's out there listening, they may, they may have gotten on the repeater, you know, 10 minutes before me and said the same thing. And now they hear me say, and it's like, oh, hey, who's that? They may know me, they may not know me. And now they know I'm out there and they can talk to me or not. Um, been many a times on the uh, Hazel Park repeater that I've logged on and said monitoring, or I've been on and I've heard one of my friends from the club log in and say monitoring. And, you know, I can start a good conversation with one of my friends from there. So that's that's what that's for. That's why you would do that. Uh, responding to station looking for a contact. Again, notice it's in red. You say the other station's signal once or call sign once, followed by this is or from your call sign. So um, and a, if, if Bob was out there and he said monitoring, I would say N8REL, this is N8VDZ. And that tells Bob, hey, I heard you say that you're monitoring. I want to talk to you. So when we say when we say this, if there's an order here that we do, you call their call sign, then yours. A, a good way to remember that is remember, hey you. It's me. Um, if you're standing in a crowd and, you know, there's 40 feet of people between you and the person you're trying to get a hold of, you don't say, I'm Mike. I'm Mike. Betty, I'm Mike. No, you'd say, hey, Betty. Betty, it's Mike. You call Betty first. Let her know you're looking for her. Um, so your call sign or their call sign, then your call sign. If you accidentally interrupt up interrupt someone, just say, hey, sorry, N8 VDZ clear. Um, and then wait for their contact to end or go to a different frequency or repeater. Um, you know, often there's conversations going on and you may be getting on so that you can specifically talk to someone else. You texted them and say, Hey, I got something I want to talk to you about. Meet me on the Hazel Park repeater. Well, you turn on your radio and find out there's already someone talking there. So you can't really interrupt their conversation, but there are lots of repeaters around. So you don't have to be on that one. Um, if you're, if you're getting on just to talk to someone, most of the time you can just, you know, someone talks and then there's a brief pause and then someone else talks and there's a brief pause and they, and they talk back and forth. Sometimes they end their, their transmission with over. Sometimes they say back to you. You know, there's lots of things that cue you into, hey, they're done talking now. And in that little space, 
you can say your call sign, N8VDZ, or you can say break. And those people having that conversation will say, go ahead, breaker, and let you, you know, they're they're letting you into the conversation. Um, and then what will happen is it'll go around in a circle. And so you just got to remember where you're at in the circle and who you're handing it to and who's handing it to you. Because sometimes these circles, I've been in them where there are four or five people. And so you just got to pay attention to, you know, who you're, who you're handing it off to so that the circle keeps going around and around. And that way you don't leave anybody out. That's how we, that's how we hold conversations on the radio with, you know, a bunch of people and everybody gets to talk. Uh, if it wasn't for that, it would be chaos. And it would just end up being two people talking back and forth. And the rest would just be sitting there listening and not be able to get a word in edgewise. So the polite thing, we try to be polite, you know, with amateur radio. So just go around in a circle. And uh, and that's how we do that. Um, if you receive a report that your signal or audio is strong but distorted, you could be slightly off frequency. You could be speaking too loudly into your microphone. You could be transmitting from a bad location. We talked about that uh, earlier, um, you know, with two meter and 70 centimeter, those waves are pretty tight together. And so you move, you know, two meters is the total length of that whole signal from, you know, from end to end. So if you move two or three, two or three or four feet, that can make a difference in whether or not you're transmitting better or not. So you might be on a net and someone might say, hey, you're not coming across very well. Can you move to a different location? They're not saying get in your car and drive someplace. They're saying, you know, move to another room in your house, move to a different spot of your place. Maybe um, maybe you were, weren't paying attention when Bob said, I think it was Bob said, when you're transmitting, your antenna needs to be up in the air, not laying down. And you may have gotten home from work and want to join that net. And so you decided you're going to lie down on the couch and talk with your little handheld. Well, now your antenna is going the wrong way. Your antenna is laying down. And so it, you might go, oh, shoot, whoops. Just turn your radio that you can continue to lay down. Just whatever your antenna is doing is what matters. So turn your antenna back up and try again. Um, if you're doing something like a little handheld and it uses batteries, your weak or low batteries could be part of the problem. Um, I don't know why this isn't red. This should be red because I know that this is a question. Um, so so remember, remember these. This is a pretty good one. Um, repeaters often add short courtesy beep the transmit signal when transmitting a state when when the transmitting station's signal disappears so like with the uh hazel park amateur radio club's repeater when i transmit and i let that key go it goes be doop and that's one way of knowing that i hit the repeater if I transmit on Hazel Parks, because I had this happen once before, I went to transmit on there and I unkeyed, it didn't go be doop. And I went, oh, wait. And and of course, no one heard me either. Um, So I had a problem that I had to fix that. That was during a net. I checked into the net and in that few minutes, I acquired a problem. Um, I was able to fix it pretty quick and was able to get back into the net and uh you know um i think it was our president mike was like mike where'd you go and vdz you there okay we'll move on to the next guy and so i called for a recheck and got back in and was able to to uh have my time in the in the uh in the net so um that courtesy beep is very very helpful 
there are a few repeaters that do not do that. So I know the one here in Warren um, does not, K-A-W-Y-N, does not have a courtesy beep. Um, but I can hear it. You know, there's a little click that I can hear when it disconnects. So I know I I know I made the connection that way. Um, let's see. Repeaters offshore to courtesy beep transmit signal when transmitting signal disappears becomes the over cue to the station start speaking. Although having over oh yeah so um, a lot of a lot of you know it's kind of one way of telling people I'm done talking is to say over. Um, we see a lot of movies and stuff. It's kind of funny. It's kind of one of my pet peeves. Um, you'll hear someone say talking on a radio to someone and they'll ask them a question. They'll say, Hey, uh, was wondering about this, that, and the other thing. Tell me about that over and out. Well, over and out means I'm done talking and I'm gone. So you're going to respond and I'm not going to be here. What? Why did you say out? So it's just kind of funny. So if you ever hear that, you know, in, in a movie or something, you will now laugh also. Um, so it's just over. Um, you don't have to say it. Just one of those things that you can say to let people know you're done. Uh, the courtesy beep lets people know you're done. Um, you could also say back to you or back to net control. There's many ways you can finish your your statement out. Um, again, reminding you of the FCC rules that we may not have covered yet, but I'll say it anyway. Um, transmission should be finished with your call sign. So, um, and that's and, you know, and that's part of the law. Um, every ten minutes, and when you're done, you need to say your call sign. So that's another way of of letting them know you're done is, you know, saying your call sign and unkeen. Simplex channels. Now we've heard about repeaters. Simplex is just being on a frequency. Both the listener and the transmitter, you know, both parties, I should say, in the conversation are on the exact same frequency. Um, we told you that the repeater, you transmit on one frequency and listen on another frequency. With simplex, you're transmitting and listening on the same frequency. Um, when we, another thing we say to be respectful about repeaters is don't tie up a repeater for an abnormally long period of time, unless you have to. If the only way you can talk to that person is on the repeater, because you live too far apart, then it's okay. But if you're talking to your neighbor two blocks away, you can probably get them simplex. And so the polite thing to do is if you reach them on the repeater, Say, hey, let's go over to such and such a frequency and talk over there and free up the repeater. Because that way, if someone else is waiting for you to be done, you can be done and let them have the repeater. Um, you know, it's easy to make contacts directly. And, and, and like they say here, it avoids tying up the repeater. Uh, many radios have a reverse split function. This is a question. Uh, on the test, um, it enables you to listen for the other station on the repeater's input frequency, um, which you're you, when you're normally listening, you're listening on the repeater's output frequency. And why that's important is sometimes someone will be talking on the repeater and they're not getting through and we don't know why. And so you know, we can help them by listening to the repeater's input and seeing if they're coming in on the input. And if they're not, oh, we can tell them, hey, it, you're not, I don't hear you on the input, so you probably haven't set your offset. 
And, you know, it's a, it's a mistake that's really easy to make. So, you know, another way of helping them. Not every radio has that, but reverse is, is on the test. So it's something you, you want to try to remember. Uh, the national simplex calling frequency on two meter is 146.52 megahertz. Um, what this is for is so that you can go out and find someone to talk to. And then, you know, you can then say, hey, let's go over to here. Um, you don't want to tie this one up um, because if other people are trying to find other people to talk to, this might be a place where they're going to do it. And if you hold a long conversation there, then they can't use this repeater what it's for. And what it's for is just finding someone else and moving on. So um, the way to remember this frequency um, for testing purposes, um, this is a question on the test. And there's a lot of 146s that they're going to give you for answers. Just remember that there's 52 cards in a standard playing deck. 146.52. That will be your correct answer on the test. And we'll see that question coming up, I think. I'm pulling out because we, we go through all the questions in this one. So um, on 70 centimeter, it's 446.00. Um, I don't have a good way to remember 446. So... You're going to have to figure out a way to remember that one. But the uh, simplex one, just remember there's 52 deck cards in a deck. I don't think there's a question on the test for the national simplex calling frequency for 70 centimeter, though. I think it's only for two meter. Uh, most amateur bands have a calling frequency. And so you can go to that uh, in your book. You know, these URLs are all in the book also, because most of this is right straight out of the book. Um, you can go to there and and uh, see that. Uh, making contacts, single sideband, CW, and digital. So starting starting contacts is different in these modes, other you know than uh, modes than on repeaters. Um, they use fixed channels. Uh, calls must be long enough to attract attention. So um, CQ, which I mentioned earlier and said I'd talk about later, here's what we're going to talk about. it. CQ means I'm calling any station. I want to talk to me, please, somebody talk to me, is what it's saying. Um, so when you're when you're on your radio, if you hear someone say, CQ, 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 this is N8VDZ, that's November 8, Victor Delta Zulu, calling CQ and standing by. They're now hoping somebody heard them say all that and will respond to them and talk to them. Um, often for contesting, you know, people will call CQ uh, so that they can get people to respond to them and you know, we'll, and we'll talk a little bit about contesting in a little while. Um, but so, um, on CW or digital, it's a little different. And you can see right there, CQ, 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 DE, your call sign three times followed by a K. Um, I don't do Morse code yet. It's on my, on my bucket list to learn. Um, and I do have uh, some material to learn it. I just haven't got there yet, but that's coming up. Retirement's coming up. So that's probably where I'm going to really dig into it. So before you call CQ, you should do three things, though, which is really what you should do even if you're just monitoring. If, you, if you're going onto a station, first, you should listen to make sure the frequency is one that you're allowed to be on. Second, you should listen to be sure the frequency is not already in use because it's just impolite to just chime in and start talking and telling people that you want CQ, CQ, hey, we're holding a conversation here, pal. 
Um, so you want to want to do that. It's also polite to listen, not hear anything, and then say, this is N8VDZ, is the frequency open? And then listen for a couple seconds. If sometimes there's a space in a conversation, I told you about going in the circle, there might be six people talking and we're going from number five to number six and there's a little gap there. Because the person said, all right, I'm going to hand it off to, gosh, I don't remember who the next guy is. Who's next? Go ahead. And now everybody in the circle's thinking for a minute, am I next? I think I'm next. Am I supposed to be next? Who's next in the circle? Yeah, I think it's me. And then you start talking and interrupt our conversation. So there could be a little pause in there. And so it's polite to find out if somebody's already there. Um, responding to a station calling CQ, when someone says CQ, 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 you would call their frequency, or I mean, sorry, their call sign, followed by your call sign. Or in some cases, people just say their call sign. So if it's contesting, that's all you do. All you're gonna do is your call sign. And you're not going to say, you're not going to say it phonetically. You're just going to say N8VDZ. And hopefully they heard you in that, in that contest, that person that's doing the contest, that's doing the CQ, they heard you. Um, they may have heard 11 people. And so you're not the one they're going to answer first, maybe. So when they say CQ again, N8VDZ, um, and hope that they heard you. So that's how you respond to someone calling CQ. Q signals. Um, Q signals are a system of radio shorthand, uh, abbreviation for common information, uh, developed by old telog telegra yeah, telegraphy codes. Um, although developed for use by Morse code operators, their use is also common in phone and voice. So even though the law says we're not allowed to, because this was a this was a stickler for me when I first got my license. It was like, wait, you say in the rules that we're not allowed to use codes and hide, you know, what we're saying. But all of a sudden we got these cue signals. So these are perfectly acceptable. They're within the law. Um, so don't, <laughs> don't freak out like I was because it was like, wait, this doesn't make sense, but it is what it is. So in your book, you will find also this page here, which gives you a list of the most common cue signals and, and what they mean. Um, good idea to print this up. There's lots of people out there that will use cue signals in their conversations and just expect you to know what they mean. Um, you know, so, you know, if you have this handy, and it doesn't matter if it's HF or UHF or VHF, if you're on a repeater or you're talking simplex, um, doesn't matter. These all apply. And, you know, people will kind of expect you to, to use them or to know them. And if you don't, you know, say so. And hopefully they'll stop using them in your conversation. But, you know, I've, I've gone on and said, you know, before I printed mine out, I've gone on and gone in and said, uh, um, you said QS and I don't know what that means. And they'll tell me, you know, oh, I was just acknowledging that I understood what you said. I understood what you said, so QSL, I got it, yep. Oh, okay. Well, now they know you don't know Q signals. Hopefully they'll stop doing it. But you never know. So good idea to have this up, just so you don't, you know, you don't have to ask and make it easier for you. And if you learn them, even better.
uh, DXing and contesting. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, DX stands for distance station. Um, you know, so thousands, you want to contact someone thousands of miles away from you, you're DXing. Um, uh, the best, the best done on single sideband or CW because of the efficiency of both of those modes. Uh, radio contests are held in which competitors try to make as many contacts as possible in a fixed period of time. Uh, during contesting, you'd send only a minimum of information needed to identify your station and complete the exchange. And at that URL there, which is in the book, are um, you know what what contests are available and and uh, arrl.com. Uh, you can go to there. I don't even think you have to be a member of arl.com. I'm pretty sure you don't. But you can go here and find the contest calendar and see what's going on next weekend or tomorrow or in a month. Um, one of the one of the the only contest I've ever really done was when I finally got my HF antenna up last year. So it was my first time talking on uh, HF and it was um, a 4th of July week. And they do this fun little contest where you try to get contacts in each of the 13 colonies. So you get, try to get a, try to, try to reach someone and you log it and they log it. And at the end of the contest, everybody sends their logs in. So there's confirmation of, you know, who made contact to who. And you get a really nice, you know, nice certificate for doing it. Um, there's a couple of bonuses that they do for extra. And the bonuses for last year's was a contact in England and a contact in France. And so... That was that was pretty cool, but you don't you could you could make contacts in two colonies and still get your certificate. You know, so it's not it's not you got to do all thirteen, but it's but it was fun. It was really kind of interesting. And when they say minimum information, all you're going to do is in most contacts is say your call sign and your location. Um, often you'll say, give a, a, a signal report telling them how strong their signal is and how clear they're coming across. Later in class, I'm not sure, I don't think it's this class, but, or this session, but we'll talk about, you know, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but um, sometimes you need to give a number. You know, you're, you're telling them how many contacts you've made and they're telling you how many contacts they've made. You know, different contests require different things, but then you're done. That's all you're doing. You're not talking about your tenant. You're not talking about your dog. You're not talking about the weather. You're only doing that. You're on, you're off. You're going someplace else to talk to someone else. And try to get get somebody else on a different frequency and get another person. So contesting is really kind of fast, and it's again, it is a contest. There will be a winner. Um, if you're not a winner, is that terrible? No, it's no big deal. They're still fun. Um, when you're talking about, you know, a, a, a thousand hams all over the state. And sometimes all over the world, I'm sorry, all over the country and sometimes all over the world being in this contest, the chances of you winning the contest are, are not great, um, especially as a new hand. You're not going to be fast at it. Um, there's lots of tricks and tools for, for logging that you won't have under your belt yet. And a, a strong contester will, you know, be in and out and have someone logged you know, in seconds, because they're doing it with their computer. They're not writing anything down. So, um, but they're fun. They're, you know, I did that, like I say, I've done only done one contest just because of time. 
Um, but I expect I'll do more, you know, in the future because they are kind of fun. Uh, one of our DXing events, this is not a contest, even though it's very contest like. There are points. You do earn points. Everybody's trying to get the most points, but no one is ever declared a winner. Everybody is a winner. And field days is the big event where um, amateurs all over the world take their equipment and go to a location other than their house or where their, their ham shack. Uh, they go to a park, they go to someplace and transmit and try to make as many contacts as they can during field day. Field day is a, uh, I think it's a 30 hour, I'm not sure exactly how many hours it is, but it goes, you know, starts midday Saturday and goes to midday Sunday sometime. 24 it, hours. Is it, Joe, is it just 24? Okay. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, the third weekend of the month. And it's just a lot of fun. Um, the Hazel Park Amateur Radio Club, I did my first field day ever last year. And uh, I will never miss another one. I had a great time at it. Um, I was doing digital, which I'd never done before. And uh, it was just a lot of fun. So um, on the uh, Hazel Park Amateur Radio Club, around that time, we will post where we'll be and where you can go and what you can do. As a technician, you can come to our field day and I can put you on a frequency that only an extra is allowed to talk on. But I'm there. I'm going to share my extra and let you use it. So if you come there, you'll be allowed to speak on frequencies that you're normally not allowed to speak on. Um, maybe you'll maybe you'll make a contact with somebody in another country. And it may be your first contract contact with somebody in another country, which is really kind of cool. Um, so our field day is a lot of fun, and I highly recommend, um, and I don't know of anybody who does a field day, any club or any group that does a field day that isn't a lot of fun. Um, it's also a great place to learn about antennas and get ideas for antennas. I love building antennas. And when I went there, it was like, oh my gosh, that's cool. I see that now. Now I know what they mean. I want to make one of those. And so I did. Um, so it's, it's, it's very cool. Very fun day. Fox hunting and direction finding. This is also something that's kind of cool and fun. Never done it before, but I expect someday I'm going to do it. And the fox hunt is, is kind of, um, it's almost like a treasure hunt. You can think of it that way. Um, somebody will put a, tra hide a transmitter someplace and it's putting out a ping. It's putting out a signal every so often. And you are trying to locate where that transmitter's at. And so I don't know if any of you guys, uh, if, if you guys are close, because I know some of you are further away. Um, there's a place called Stony Creek Metro Park. Um several hundred, if not thousand acres of land, of park land, and, you know, um, just places for people to picnic and stuff like that. Nice, nice place to go. Be a great place for a fox hunt because someplace in there you could hide this transmitter and then people are on foot going to hunt around and try to find, you know, where it's at. Now, why it's important is not just to have fun. There was a gentleman uh, about a year ago. Um, I don't remember where he was at, but he was in a in a region that was a little bit hilly. And um, during the day, it was you know it was the time of season where it was you know during the day it was you know sixty degrees, but at night it was going to drop down below 32. And this was an old guy. He was in his 70s. 
and he had a little cottage up there and decided he was going to go for a walk and decided what the heck I'll just bring my radio with me I had I had, he had he had heard that someone had put up a repeater about a mile from there and thought well maybe I'll pull up my radio if I get bored and you know try to see if I can make a contact well he was walking and just enjoying nature and a couple hours went by and he realized that he wasn't sure where he was at. And so he tried to find his way back and realized that he really had no idea where he was. And he was literally in the middle of nowhere. And so he pulled out his radio and tried to make a contact. And because of that repeater, he was able to make a contact. They let his wife know, who was already panicked, and let her know that they're in contact with them. And then with fox hunting, they were able to find him because he. they asked him to transmit every few minutes and they used, you know, directional finding um, antennas and were able to locate him and the way the story, the the way I remember the story, that night it went down to like 18 degrees. He surely would have perished that night had it not been for fox hunting and his, his uh, ham radio. So pretty cool story. Um, the directional antennas that would be used for fox hunting is a Yagi antenna. And Bob showed you one of those uh, a week or two ago. Uh, it's very directional finding and great for this kind of stuff. Um, uh, and similar event is radio direction finding, which is what we just talked about with finding the old guy. Pretty cool stuff. Video. I've never done anything with video. Uh, two primary means of exchanging pictures or videos in real time, amateur television, ATV, on the UHF bands at 430 megahertz and higher and fast scan color television signals, NTSC, National Television System Committee, uh, slow scan television, SSTV, um, sends still signals. Um, like I say, I've never done this, so I don't know very, a whole lot about this. And I don't, no, I don't think there's a whole lot on the test, except for I think there's something about still signal because it's red. So um, slow scan, still signals, kind of lock that in your head. And then in your book, there's these uh, um, you, uh, URLs for learning more about that. All right, so some practice questions. Uh, why may, okay, I got to move this out of my way here. Get this bar in my way. It's cover up the top of my screen. All right, why are single sideband SSB, single sideband phone used in amateur bands above 50? I'm sorry, where may single sideband phones be used in amateur radio bands above 50 megahertz? And the answer is at least some segment in all of these bands. And I'll tell you, some of these, I may have a way for you to uh, remember on your test, but a lot of these are, are just kind of be, you're just gonna have to bear down and remember them. Um, I hope you are taking practice exams. Um, if you're not, you should start. Now's the good time to get started. We've got, covered a lot of information and that can be covered in them. You can do your practice, practice exam by chapter, or you can just say, give me a practice exam and it'll give you everything, which is okay too, even though we haven't covered it yet. Um, but my personal opinion, you're gonna pass the test if you take practice exams. If you don't pr take practice exams, 
you may pass the test. Okay. But if you take practice exams fairly regularly, I can pretty much guarantee you're going to pass the test. So please do them. They're very, very helpful. Um, so uh, what is a band plan beyond the what is a band plan beyond the privilege, privileges established by the FCC? And as I said before, it's a voluntary guideline for using different modes or activities within an amateur band. So just remember, it's voluntary. Okay, It's not the law, even though it kind of is the law. If you get outside the frequency in the band plan and you do that regularly and don't care yep they can take away your license but the guy you know it's a it, it's a voluntary guideline so just remember that it's a voluntary guideline and that gives you the answer for this one what term describes an amateur station that is transmitting and receiving on the same frequency so this is not a repeater. It's the same frequency. It's one frequency, so it can't be duplex. It can't be multiplex. It's one, so it's simplex. Simple is one. <clears throat> what is the appropriate way to call another station on a repeater if you know the other station's call sign? Say that station's call sign. Then identify with your call sign. Hey, you, it's me. Which of the following indicates a station is listening on a repeater or looking for a contact? The station call sign followed by the word monitoring. Um, this is kind of a tricky one. Because, well, CQ, CQ, didn't you say CQ, Mike? Is, uh, and yeah, that, that is a way. But the, the answer they're looking for here, if you're on a repeater, you don't necessarily, you don't normally say CQ on a repeater. And that's where, that's where the difference is. Um, also, you don't ever really say the repeater's call sign. I don't remember ever using the repeater's call sign except for in a preamble, which we'll talk about later. Um, so a lot of times in these answers, you can eliminate. You know, you, Mike, well, Mike never said anything about the repeater, saying the repeater's call sign, but it did say CQ. No, but I don't the repeater's call sign. So that one's got to be out. Um, so just remember monitoring. Uh, what might be a problem if you receive a report that your audio signal uh, through an FM repeater is distorted or intelligible? Your transmitter is slightly off frequency. The batteries are running low. You might be in a bad location. Yep, all of those are right. Oh, look, and there's an all choices are correct. And this is the one that I talked to you about before, the uh, FM simplex calling frequency, 146, 52 cards in a deck. And that'll, you know, also remembering two meter band. So now that I'm looking at these answers, there's only two of them that are in the two meter band, the 146 and the 145. The 432 and the 446 are 70 centimeters. And so another way of eliminating answers here is if you remember that math problem I told you, 300 divided by the frequency in megahertz will tell you the band. So you can eliminate two answers if you really don't remember, gosh, which one of these is it? You can eliminate two of the answers immediately by um, doing that simple little math problem to find out where two meter is. 
How is HF UHF transceiver reverse function used? And like I told you before, it's to listen to the repeater's output. I'm sorry, input frequency. Uh, that's the one that you don't usually hear. You usually hear the repeater's output frequency. And so this allows you to listen to something different, listen to its input frequency. Why are simplex channels designated in designated in UHF band plans? So stations within a range of each other can communicate without trying tying up a repeater. Okay. Again, you know, we don't want to tie up repeaters. So if you can not tie up a repeater, that's a good thing. So if you keep that in your head, you don't want to tie up a repeater. There you go. There's your answer for that one. Uh, how should you respond to a station calling CQ? And you would transmit the other station's call sign followed by your call sign. Again, hey you, it's me. Uh, what is the meaning of procedural signal CQ? And that is simply calling any station. What should you do before calling CQ? Uh, listen first, ask if the frequencies you can use, make sure you're legal on that frequency. All of those are correct. Uh, which Q signal indicates that you are receiving interference from other stations? I think there's only one or two Q signal questions. So as you're looking through your book, you might, you know, as you're, or as you're doing testing, you know, your practice tests, if you run across Q signal questions, just write those down. And those are the ones you'll need to need to remember. So you won't have to memorize all the Q signals you'll only have to memorize a couple of them. So QRM is one of them. Oh, there are a couple. Okay, so QSY is another one. And that means you're changing your frequency. And I don't know if you can come up, you might come up with a way of remembering that Q. RM. RM means interference, receiving interference. It's RM though. Um, what is RM and receiving? You might come up with something that helps you remember that RM means receiving interference other than just rote memory. Uh, if you can get a little mnemonic for that, um, or, you know, for all these, might be a good idea to just to help you, or you just have to memorize it you know, QSY means I'm changing to a different frequency. Uh, what operating activity involves contacting as many stations as possible during a specific period? That's contesting. We talked a lot about contesting, and contesting is kind of fun. Which of the following good procedure is a good procedure when contacting another station in a contest? And that's just sending only the minimum information needed for the proper identification and contest, contest, contest exchange. So you want to say what you need to say and move on. Say what you need to say and move on. Say what you need to say and move on. So if you just think that, you'll be good. What is a grid locator? Well, how interesting that this question is here, but we didn't cover this in this chapter yet. Why did they do that? I'm not sure. Okay, so grid locator, the world is has been covered in a grid and been numbered. Um, let me, I was just looking at grid locator earlier and do I? I do not. I was hoping that maybe, oh, maybe I do. Hold on. 
Yes, I do. Look at that. So, look. I'm going to put in me instead of Bob. And he, okay, we, we he, can't. He, we're, we're still lo looking at the question. Oh, you are? Shoot. Yeah. I, I think you have to unshare and reshare. Stop share. And. Share. Share. Okay, now what are you seeing? Are you seeing it now, Bob? Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, yes, we see it now. All right. The Maidenhead Grid Square, uh, yeah, yep. with uh, so Hazel Park and submit, Royal Oak. And, mm -hmm. So if I say submit, and I just put mine in there, I could have put my address in here. I could have put a, a different grid square in here. So, and then when I say show map, it's going to show, whoop, it's going to show me, you know, that square. This, the world is divided up into squares that are that big. And this square is EN82. Um, those are lowercase L's, by the way. And I don't know why they do lowercase. Makes me crazy. But EN82LL is my grid square. Generally, when they're talking about grid squares, we're only going to say EN82. They don't want necessarily the detail that close. I'm pretty sure Bob and most of us live in EN82. You know, it's a pretty big, pretty big square on the map. So um, that's what that's what that's all about. Now, let me see if I do this. Are you back to the presentation? Yes, we're back to the presentation, back to the grid Wait. locator question. Excellent. So I shared the correct screen this time. So now I can go back and forth to stuff. So that's it's a letter number designation of a geographic location. So like I said, we're in EN82. Um, some of you, I think, I, I think there's someone in this class that is farther away than than I recall, maybe even out of state. I'm not sure. Um, but you may not be in EN82, but I think a lot of the people in this class are all in EN82. But you can find out by going to just Googling amateur radio grid square. And there's a bazillion different sites you can go to to find your grid square. You, you know, some will ask you your name, your your address. Some will ask you your city and zip code. Some will ask you for your call sign. Some will ask you for different things, and they'll give you the grid square. Uh, what type of transmission is indicated by the term NTSC? That's an analog fast scan color TV signal. And... Um, Again, some of these terms you're just going to have to remember. And again, taking the practice exams will really help you to, to lock in these answers. Keep in mind that on, and I think we may have said this before, but just in case, A, B, C, D. What I'm showing you on the screen is C. When you take the test or when you take a practice exam, it's not going to be C, most likely. It might be. Who knows? It might be. So don't remember C as the answer is what I'm trying to get at. Okay? Um, so because they will, they will change from test to test. Um, so don't remember a letter. Just remember, you know, which is the right answer. And there might be something in here, you know, when you're taking the practice exam, 
NT, you all you might remember is NTSC and analog. You remember putting those two things together and you got the answer. Just like that. Which of the following methods is used to locate sources of noise interference and jamming? And that's radio direction finding. It's also good for rescuing people. Um, but yeah, and this is this is often used for, you know, when when people are doing bad things, interference and jamming, um, they shouldn't be. Maybe they have their license, maybe they don't have their license, and they're just being a jerk. This is how the FCC finds them. Um is with radio direction finding. And they find them and they find them. Um, they find them and they find them and take their license away. So if somebody makes you mad on the radio, go to a different frequency. Turn your radio off and come back later when they're not there. Don't try to, you know, be malice back to them by causing interference or jamming or making you know horn noises or sound noises into your microphone um that's noise interference by the way um don't do stuff like that because you are being worse than them there's there's no law against being a jerk there is law against radio jamming and noise interference so don't let someone make you break the law Guess where I'm going with that. Uh, which of these terms would be useful in hidden transmitter you hunt? Uh, that's di a directional antenna. We talked about that, and that's that Yagi antenna. It's a directional, very directional antenna. Okay, using repeaters. Moving that bar back out of my way here. Let me check my time. 8.22, I got to go. Uh, technicians commonly make contacts through repeaters. Uh, to find repeaters in your area, you need a listing sorted by area. Um, there's many ways of getting um, lists of repeaters. There are repeater books you can buy. Um, part of the problem is repeaters come and go. So you spend a lot of money on a repeater book. And a lot of money, that's all relative. You, you can decide what a lot of money is. Um, I did buy a repeater book, but I also did find out that, um, you know, it was uh, you know four or five years ago I bought it. And in that four or five years, some of these repeaters have gone bye-bye. It, it is what it is. Um, so there are electronic ways of finding repeaters, which are a little more up to date. Um, you know, using your computer to do it, which are a little more up to date, but they're also not necessarily accurate. So you will find uh, listings of repeaters, whether they be in books or whether they be online, that really are just down. They don't, they don't exist anymore. And why they're still in the list is because no one has told the creator of the list that that repeater is no more. So it is what it is. Uh, you can use scanning function on your radio to listen for activity on repeaters or simplex channels. A lot of radios have a scanner function that just goes through. Um, some of them go through your memories. Some of them just scan a range of frequency. You say, I want to go from here to here. And it just scans back you know, over and over and over and over and over. And when someone starts transmitting, boom, it stops on that frequency because it found something. Uh, to access your repeater, we need to know three things. The repeater's transmitter output or transmit frequency. You'll need to know the repeater's input or receive frequency. And most repeaters have an access control tone. 
We just call it a tone. And so you'll need to know those three and you'll need to program that into your radio so that when you listen, it listens on a frequency. When you push that transmit button, it changes to the transmit frequency and also sends the tone. And some of them have a tone that sends back to your radio. Some of them don't. Um, but these are the three things you need to, to do that. Sounds a little complicated. And on some of the little handheld radios, it's scary complicated. Um, but there's software you can use to program your radio. Uh, for Warren Cert, um, I program all our little radios so that everybody has the same frequencies and the same memories. So no one on our team needs to worry about that. For the Hazel Park Amateur Radio Club, I've also put that out. If you've got a little handheld that you need programmed, I'm happy to just program in, you know, all the Macomb County, Oakland County, and Wayne County repeaters into your radio. Let me know when you want it done, and I'm happy to bring it to the meeting and and do it. It'll take me 10 minutes. So, um, you know, it, it gets some of those little handhelds are just painful to use. Um, but those three things you need to put in or you're not going to be able to transmit and receive. You'll go to the receive frequency because that's the one you know automatically, and you'll hear stuff but no one will ever hear you without those other two pieces in there. Uh, repeater offset shift. Uh, to listen to a repeater, the tone, uh, to a repeater tone to its output frequency. Uh, to send a signal through the repeater, you must transmit on the repeater's input frequency. We've covered all this. The difference between repeater input and output frequency is called the repeater's offset or shift. Uh, for two meters, it's usually plus or minus 600 kilohertz. And for 70 centimeter, it's usually uh, plus or minus five megahertz. And so um, when, you, when you set up those frequencies, the input and the output, they're pretty standard for the most part. Some go a little wacky and do different things, but there's always notes for that. Um, but it's pretty standard for two meter to be plus or minus 600 kilohertz. So when you hit that button and you're on a frequency and you hit that button to transmit, it's going to change by 600 kilohertz up or down, depending on, on what they've chosen. Um, so pretty, pretty easy, especially after you've done it a couple of times to get there. <coughs> Linked repeater system and access tones. Uh, to extend the range, repeaters sometimes use remote receivers. Uh, these can be linked to other repeaters by sharing the signal through receive and transmit them. So we have a lot of remote transmitters for the Hazel Park repeater. It's in Oak Park, but you know, sometimes if you're in um uh like let's see, maybe Mount Clemens. Mount Clemens might be a, a little bit of different distance to reach the Hazel Park repeater, but um we might have a listener in between there. And so that that little listener repeater will link your signal and send it to the Hazel Park repeater. And that way, hey, you do make it to the repeater. Uh, most repeaters don't pass signals from the receiver to the transmitter for uh, retransmission unless it contains an access tone. And um, we talked about that tone. That's one of the three things you usually need. Some, very few, but some repeaters do not use a tone. And sometimes, even with the Hizzle Park uh, um, repeaters, one of our link, or I'm sorry, our um, uh, UHF 
the the 70 centimeter one um sometimes there's been some problems with that and so they've shut the tone off on that and sometimes they you know i think after they fix it they turn the tone back on so you know you just have to have to get a get a feel for and pay attention to documentation and what's out there for tone or not but usually there's a tone um uh, continuous tone coded squelch system, CC, CTCSS. Um, um, it's a sub audible tone. Um, your uh, operating manual will explain how to select and activate the tone. Uh, there are several tone options that are used. Um, and so a lot of radios will have those tones programmed in and you just have to flip through the list until you get to the right tone uh you know it might be 107.3 um and you select that tone and there you go you got it um a, a lot of repeaters in this area use 100 I'll, I'll tell you that so in in uh Southeastern Michigan, a lot of the ones that I've been on, and I've been on a bunch of them, their their tone is set at 100. So that's a, you know, if you don't know the tone, um, I guess you could go through and just try and try and try. That's kind of, I don't know if I'd do that. I don't know if I have the patience to do that. But if you don't know the tone, I might try 100. And if it works, I'm golden. If not, I might use other means to try to find out what the tone is. But uh, troubleshooting repeaters. If you can, if you can hear a repeater signal, but they can't hear you, you want to make sure your offset is set right. You know, if your offset, you know, if they're doing negative 600 and you have a positive 600 set in, you're not going to get to them. You're going the wrong way. So make sure your offset is set right. Make sure you have the right type of frequency uh, access, you know, the right tone set up. Um, and that is the, you know, from my experience, that's the biggest one that, that people mistake on. Oops. I had the tone set wrong. Um, I hear that all the time. Uh, make sure your radio's digital code squelch settings are set correct. So practice questions here. Does the scanning function of FM transceiver, what does that do? Uh, uh, it tunes through range of frequencies to check for activity. Uh, what What is a common repeater frequency offset for the two meter band? And like we said, it's plus or minus 600 kilohertz. Um, and the only way, only way I can help you with memory on this one is try to remember that it's 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 kilohertz for first so that cuts out two of the answers and then if you can remember that the 70 centimeter is five it's five megahertz but it's five then remember that for two meter it's six but it's 600 okay so if you can remember kilohertz and six you got the answer and then you just have to remember that for 70 centimeter because that question is also in here it's five megahertz the answer is also here which is they're trying to trick you and here's the one for 70 centimeter it's five megahertz What is meant by repeater offset? Checking my time real quick, 8.34, 30 minutes. Uh, what is meant by repeater offset? And that's the difference between the repeater's transmit and receive. So that's the offset between transmit and receive frequencies. Uh, which of the following describes a linked repeater in a network? And that's a network of repeaters in which signals received received by one repeater 
are transmitted by all repeaters on the network. So if you can just remember that this one is a network, you know, remember that, you know, linked repeater network, it's a network. And the only answer in here that has anything about a network is the correct one. Uh, what term describes the use of subaudible tone transmitted along with normal voice audio open the squelch of a receiver? And that's CTCSS. I have no idea how to help you remember that. Uh, which of the following can be the reason you are unable to accept repeater uh, whose output you can hear? Uh, improper offset. Wrong CTCS zone, wrong DCS code. All of these are right. Digital repeater systems. Uh, ham radio can be linked. Ham radio and internet, internet can link repeaters and communicate nearly anywhere on the earth, which is pretty cool. Uh, some of these systems include RLP, Echolink, Wires 2, D-Star, and DMR. DMR and Echolink are probably the two biggest. Uh, Echolink, I think, is probably the biggest. Uh, it's really easy to use. You can use Echolink on your cell phone. I'm not sure about any of the rest of these, but Echolink, you know, you can put it on your laptop, you can put it on your computer, you can put it on your cell phone. So... If you're on vacation someplace and you regularly check into your club's net and you don't want to miss your club's uh, net this week and you're, you know, a thousand miles away or you're in another country, well, you can pull out your phone and get on Echo Link and still check in. It's kind of cool. Um... IRLP and echo link contacts differ from regular repeater contacts. Uh, initiating station must know the repeater's control code and request an IRLP connection uh, sequence of the DTMF or dual tone multi frequency tones. It's going to be a question on DTMF dual tone multi frequency tones. So remember that. Uh, wire wires two uh, is voice only standard. Uh, D star combines digital voice and data communications. DMR is a technique for uh, time multiplexing in digital voice signals on a single 12.5 kilohertz repeater channel. Uh, the digital code, also called color codes are used to access specific repeater simulate, similar to CTSS or PL access tones um, on an analog FM repeater. Um, so there is a question about color codes, I'm pretty sure. So we'll see if that's coming up. Um, so, you know, your program radio with uh, ID codes and you can join groups uh, audio and share with other members of the group. Um, they're sometimes hard to set up. I know members have had some some uh, struggles setting them up, but uh, I guess once you set these things up, and I don't I don't use DMR, um, but once you set it up, I guess you're you can you're rock solid. I haven't heard anybody say I set it up and then it stopped working. So. Um, digital repeaters, you don't uh, need different radios for each digital voice system. Uh, Hotspots are used that link your digital transceiver to the internet. Uh, and software in the hotspot makes your connection. Uh, Wires 2 system, uh, System Fusion, D-Star, DMR, P25, and NXDN all use talk groups in one form or another and talk groups are groups that you'll set up within the uh the 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 thing to 
to uh, actually communicate with people. If you're not in a talk group, you're not going to be talking to anybody. Nets. Nets are... Uh, um, Nets are, there's several, I'm not going to read what's on the screen here. I'm just going to try to go through this quicker, and I think I can explain it faster than just reading. Um, you know, Nets were originally, or, you know, were originally designed so that people could practice and be ready. Uh, if there was an emergency, um, the net will uh, activate, and you already know how to talk on a net. Uh, nets are a little different. There's closed nets, there's open nets, but most nets are closed nets. And a closed net does not mean it's private. You can't be there. A closed net means um, that, and there's another name for it than closed, um, but I can't remember what it is right now. Um, but what it means is the net is controlled. Um, in other words, you can't just chime in and say something. If you want to talk, you have to say uh, net control. This is N8VDC for a comment. And then you shut up. And net control comes back to you and says, go ahead with your comment, N8VDC. Or they might say, sit tight, N8VDC. We have, you know, other things going on that, you know, have priority. Um, um or they might just let you say your comment. If it's, you know, a net like the uh, Sunday night two meter am uh, two meter net that the uh, uh, Hazel Park Amateur Radio Club has every Sunday night. Um, you know, we, we uh, it's, you know, it's a controlled net, it's a closed net and um, people ch check into that net. And then after you check in, um, you are acknowledged. And then we built up a list of people. And then we go through that list and give you the microphone. What do you want to talk about? You might want to talk about the antenna you built last week. You might want to talk about that you went on vacation. We have a guy from Australia that checks in regularly. And he tells us the weather in Australia. He tells us what's going on, you know, holiday-wise and stuff like that. Um, they're in a different hemisphere than us. So they get different weather, they get different stuff than we do. So it's kind of cool to hear them talk every week. Um, I run a net on Monday nights, a uh, Warren Community Emergency Response Team, CERT net. And uh, that's every other, the second and fourth Mondays of the month. And that is really for emergencies. So we try to stay pretty tight within the rules if you want to talk, you must address net control. Um, um, we use it as practice for CERT members um, so that they can get used to, if there's an emergency, how am I going to operate? How am I going to talk? What do I say? What do I do? How do I address the net control? Um, um, while at the same time, it's not just for Warren CERT. Anybody who wants to check into that net can check into that net, but everybody needs to follow the rules. It's a controlled net. So uh, when people talk on the net, messages that are transmitted is called traffic. And exchange of messages is called traffic handling. So those two terms, I think, are both in the questions. Uh, net structure and participation, and we've pretty much talked about all that. Uh, exchanging messages on the net, and we've talked about that. Um, when you pass a message on a net, you're actually passing a message. If it was a real emergency, the Red Cross, let's say, might say to you, hey, you, you're my radio guy. Um, here's the message I need passed, and they will hand you or they, they will either tell you and you will scribe it. And then they will look at it, proofread it, and make sure that that's the words I want. Or they will hand you the, the, uh, the form. There's a number on it, but I can't remember what it is. They'll hand you the form that has their message, and you must pass that message word for word, letter for letter. 
when you pass a message, it must be accurate. If you change that message, problems can happen. So we pass along exactly what that is. Messages are formatted as radiograms, they're called. Um, in a net, there's a preamble. Um, and the preamble or the header contains bits of information about what the net is, um, what we're, what the net's purpose is, how to address the net, how we're gonna go through the net, what's gonna happen in the net, stuff like that. So the preamble is just a text. Um, every net has a preamble and it's an actually written script that, you know, we do it for Hazel Park, we do it for Warren Cert. It's a written script that I, net control, am gonna read word for word what it is. Now with Warren Cert, um, you know, I'm in charge of it. I give my net control my other net controllers the preamble and I want them to do it word for word. With Hazel Park, it's not based on emergency, it's based on friendship. Um, so that net, we're a little freer. So I do some of the net control for that. I'm the fifth Sunday guy for that. And um, I'm allowed to um, alter it a little, put it in some of the things in my words. You know, sometimes people have trouble reading something and they trip over phrases that they're just not comfortable. Well, you know what? I can change that phrase in that in the Hazel Park preamble because... Bob, who is in charge of the Hazel Park uh, net, um, has told me I can. So I've been given permission, but Warren Cert, I've told my guys, no, you can't. So di different nets do different things with that preamble, but it's basically just the how the net works. So if someone ever says, hey, do you want to run a net sometime? Would you like to, to be a net controller? Um, know that all that preamble, all that stuff that they said in the beginning, it's all written down for you. You just got to be able to read. If you can read, you can run a net. It's pretty cool. Um, I'm going to just flash through this because there's not a lot of questions on that, and we covered most of it anyway. Um, what type of signaling uses pairs of audio tones? And that's the DTMF. Um Again, another one that you're just going to have to uh, find a way to remember that one. I don't have any way of helping you with that. I'm sorry. Well, Mike, there is one thing. Yeah. And that is, um, since uh, it's talking about pairs of audio tones, and DTMF stands for dual tone multifrequency, dual oh. meaning two, and pairs of audio tones, that could help a little. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, if you can remember that that DTFE means DTMF means dual tone, um, or multiple. You know, the M means multiple and D means dual. Uh, that that would really help. Thanks, Bob. Uh, how can how can you join Digital Repeaters Talk Group? And that's by programming your radio with the group's ID or code. Um, I don't use, uh, you know, uh, talk groups at all. So I don't know how you'd get that ID. Just know that you need to get an ID. Uh, what What is the purpose of color code? Here's that color code question I told you about on DMR repeater systems. There's really no color, it's not red, green, blue. It's just a um, a code that they call a color code. And so you must match that repeater's color code for access. You got to have the same code for access. So I'm not sure who decided it was called the color code, um, but someone did. And there you have it. Uh, what function is performed with a transceiver and a digital mode hotspot, and that's communicating using digital voice or data system via the internet. 
So digital hotspot and internet go hand in hand together. So um, you can put those two together. You got that answer. Ooh, 10 minutes. Uh, what does DMR code plug contain? Access information for repeaters and talk groups. Um, uh, how is a specific group of stations selecting a digital voice trans uh, transceiver by entering the group's identification code? I'm going to stop right here for just a sec. I'm going to go here. I just want to look at something real quick. And yeah, there's more. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the questions and go back to information um, because I wanna I wanna get through the information uh, more than I wanna get through the questions for you guys. So, uh, communication for public service, Aries and Racies. They're the two largest amateur radio emergency response organizations. They're ARIES, Amateur Radio Emergency Service, and RACES, Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service. Uh, ARIES consists of licensed amateurs who have registered their qualifications and equipment for duty in public service. There's a lot of testing. There's a lot of... Uh, uh, things you need to do to be a part of this. Um, I am part of it. Um, um, it's it's kind of interesting. It's kind of fun and, you know, making me be prepared if there's an emergency. Um, it's FEMA testing predominantly. Um, it's not hard, um, but there is a lot. Um, you know, to go through one class is, I don't know, two, three hours of 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 actual work and then there's a test and you pass the test and you get that that particular certification um more tests you take the more you go the more abilities you have and i don't want to say the higher you climb up the ranks because there aren't necessarily ranks or at least i'm not looking for ranks but if the emergency happens and i say hey i'm a ham guy I can help, and I then say, "Here's here's the training I've had." And another ham guy comes up and says, "Well, I don't have any training, but I'm a ham guy. They're going to use me because I got the training. I know how to deal with emergencies. I know how to. I know what I'm supposed to do in an emergency. I know who to talk to and how to talk to. I know what I can and can't do, or should and shouldn't do, and so." That's the guy they want. And so that's why I, you know, take the test and do that. Um, I'm not sure about races, what is required for that, because I I haven't done anything races, but Aries, Aries I do. Uh, threats to life and property. Uh, no provisions to these rules shall prevent the use of amateur station in any means of radio communications at its disposal to provide essential communication in need of connection of immediate safety to human life and immediate protection of property when normal communications are not available. Okay, that's the law. That is an FCC law. So, um, you know, it's... It, it, if there's an emergency and there is no other form of communication, the radio is the one. Um, and it, it must be made available. Um, if, let me say this though, if you're using your radio for an emergency and you have your cell phone sitting next to you, you're not doing it right. Call 911. <laughs> okay. So, you know, this is a provision, you know, when when there 
when when other when normal communication systems are not available okay um so just you know we don't want to uh, uh, go out of our bounds uh, you are bound by fcc rules at all times uh even if using your radio in support of public safety agency um and part of what this is saying is if you're you know if you're uh, you know, a piece of what this is saying is if you're on your on your repeater and you're talking and somebody breaks in and says, I have an emergency, you know, we've said, be polite. If someone's talking on the radio, you know, you don't interrupt them. You don't get in their way. You shouldn't, you know, it's no one owns the frequency. Um, well, except in an emergency. When there's an emergency, that person owns the frequency, period. They don't say it in those words, but that's what that's what you need in your head. And if there's a question on the test for that, if that thought path is in your head, the only time someone owns a frequency is when there's an emergency, they get the right of way, period. Um, that's not only the right thing to do, but it's the law. Satellite operating. The International Space Station. There's astronauts up there in space right now. Uh, um, most of the uh, most of the uh, radios up there are two meter and seventy centimeter uh, that are that are out in space. They're mostly two meter and seventy centimeter. Uh, the International Space Station uses both. Uses one for uplink and one for downlink. Um, we had the distinct privilege. I was the uh, one of the radio operators uh, last year. Maybe it was the year before last. It was the year before last, 2022, working with a school in Detroit um, where like 25 kids, 25 high school kids got to talk to a astronaut in space and each kid got to ask a question. And we got to set up the antennas and set up the radios and set up the whole program. We built antennas for them and built a whole system for them. Um, it was a fantastic event. It's still one of my one of my top five things I've done in my life. It was so, so cool talking to the guys in space. Um, uh, amateurs have built more than 50 satellites since 1961. On those satellites, there's no people. There's just the radio. So it's a repeater. And so you can use that radio to, from you know here in Metro Detroit, I've talked to people in you know Wisconsin. I've talked to people in New York. And that's not supposed to be possible, but it is because we're talking in that repeater that's able to transmit that far because it's up in space and it's transmitting over a, a much wider area. So it's really pretty cool to be able to do that. Um, amateur satellites are named Oscar Orbit, Orbiting Satellite Carrying Amateur Radio. Uh, a technician can communicate through satellite listening or uplink signals on two meter and transmitting on a 10 meter downlink frequency, downlink frequency, even though a technician is not permitted to transmit on 10 meters. Um, so, so you're allowed to do that. Um, um, and I'm not sure why the rule allows you to do it, but you are allowed to do that with, you know, satellite. Uh, some satellite definitions. Apogee, the point at the satellite's orbit is furthest from the Earth. Um, and apogee is often used with the moon, too. And we may talk about that in a later class. I'm not sure if that's technician level, though. Um, but we'll we'll see. Uh, beacon satellite, a signal from a satellite containing information about a satellite. Uh, Doppler shift. Um, you've you've heard a train go by where the the sound of the horn goes. Nah, nah. It really didn't change its tone. It just, as it went by, the Doppler shift happened, and it sounded like the tone got lower, but it really didn't. It was the same tone. It just sounded. So we deal with Doppler shift. 
um, uh, elliptical orbits. Uh, LEO, a satellite in low orbit. Uh, perigee, uh, the point at a satellite's orbit that's nearest to Earth, and that's the opposite of apogee. Um, we often hear those terms with the moon, so you may already be familiar with those. Space stations defined by the FCC as an amateur station located more than 50 kilometers above the Earth's surface. I believe that's a question on the test. So a space station is an amateur station located more than 50K above the Earth's surface. Uh, spin fading is a signal fading caused by rotation of a satellite and its antennas. That is also, I believe, a question. So spin fading when that satellite is orbiting the Earth, it's also possibly rotating. And as it rotates, you might get spin fading. Ooh, and it's nine o'clock, shoot. Let me see where I'm at. I'm. I got to be close. I am. I just have a couple more slides here. Are you okay to go? Uh, maybe five minutes more because the rest of these are all questions, and we won't do the questions. Anybody? Everybody okay with two or three minutes more? Actually, sure. it's one more slide. There we go. <laughs> go uh, for it. <laughs> operating via satellites. Uh, let me make this big again. Uh, most satellites only have one operational mode. Um, uh, specified as two letters separated by a slash. The uplink satellite in UV mode is the UHF band, 70 centimeter, and the downlink is in VHF, 2 meter. Uh, satellites can use any amateur mode, most common single sideband, FM, or CW, and data. Um, you can tell when a satellite is within range by listening for the beacon, which is transmitted via carrier wave or RTTY. Um, there's a lot of software out there that, you know, like we use software when we work with the school that we were watching satellites as they passed over us. So we knew exactly where these, the uh, ISS was, and we knew exactly where it was going to pass over us and at what angle it was going to pass over us, because they don't often go straight over our head. You know, they're off at an angle. And so we have to be, we have to aim our Yagi directional antenna at that. And as it travels across, we want to move our antenna to stay pointed at it. And so there's software that can help you do that. And it's pretty cool. Uh, this, uh, you, uh, this telemetry data from satellite contains information also on the health and status of the satellite. Uh, anyone can relieve satellite telemetry. I don't even think you need to be an amateur radio operator. I don't think you need to have a license. You can receive satellite telemetry, you know, if you're a human being and you're able to do it. Um, the minimum amount of trans, and I think that's a question, by the way, on the test, uh, that anybody can receive satellite telemetry. Uh, the use of minimum amount of transmitter power to contact satellites. Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to send too much power to a satellite. Um, there's multiple reasons for it, um, but their relay transmit power is limited by solar panels and batteries. And, you know, you don't want your signal sucking up all their all their battery. Um, you don't want to do it. You, you know, you just don't want to do harm. Everybody wants to be able to reach that bad boy. And uh, so we have to be nice. And then we just have questions from here out. So I'm going to let you guys... Uh, Go on the uh, on the questions. You know, do the questions yourself. Um, where is my Zoom screen? Come on. I have lost my Zoom screen again. Bob, why does it always do that to me? There it is. I don't know. Okay, how can I stop sharing? Stop 
share. There we go. There we go. Now I got my screen back. Um, so were there any questions from everybody? I know we went over and I apologize that we went over. Um, but does anybody have any questions that are burning in their head that they'd uh, like to like to hit on? Or do you want to write them down and share them for next week? Either way is fine with me. Sounds like we're good. Sounds like we're good. I'm glad to hear it. So if something comes up during the week, feel free to feel free to contact us uh, if you want. Or, you know, next week, um, you know, we always come in, you know, 10 minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes early. And uh, we can we can flash some questions if they're burning in your mind then. Yeah. Next week, uh, Jerry is going to be back up. Next week, Jerry is going to be talking about equipment, <laughs> stuff, parts as parts. Cool and, stuff. Uh, chapter <laughs> five. Yeah. Chapter five. And uh, yeah, that's good stuff. And he does a lot of show and tell on that. That's uh that's kind of one of the fun chapters. Absolutely. So you guys get the good chapters. I'm the new teacher. I get the boring ones. <laughs> oh, you got you got chapter two. And chapter two is one of my favorite ones. Oh, I agree. I agree. I did like chapter the two. Radio nope. radio signals, you know. And I'm and, just messing with you, Bob. It's all I'm doing. <laughs> okay. I did I I I you know, I I do find this stuff that I taught tonight to be very, very important. And uh, it, is. it just doesn't have a lot of pictures and a lot of things to show. It's yeah. just a lot of talking and a lot of words. Yeah. Um, that's that's the that's 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 the only problem I have with with you, the student. Is I don't I can't get fancy with it. I'd like to, but I can't. It is what it is. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Week. I hope you guys all have a great week, and okay. we'll see you next week. <laughs>